All right, good morning. How is everyone doing today? Good, welcome back to History Forum. So glad you made it out. We are excited. Yeah, I think an applause is good, thank you. I mean, that was our director, Kent Whitworth, so, you know, he's a little bit of a, you know, bias there, but. Um, so glad to have you. This is our 20th season of History Forum, which is impressive. Uh, when I came aboard uh, to MNHS and was handed this, I knew there was some responsibility. This is a, a popular series, it's an important series for us. And I think it's such a terrific opportunity that we get to bring in uh, some of the top scholars working in American history from across the country to share their uh, great research with us. And we really want to make sure that this is a space where we're highlighting the best of uh, historical research that's happening. Uh, and so we have a great season. If you don't know the whole season, please take a look. Uh, we got information on our website. We got flyers out on the front, uh, the check-in desk. Hopefully all of you just subscribe to the whole series because we've got a really good lineup. Um, and a couple other things I want to mention that are coming up to take a look at. Particularly, uh, we do have some great events coming up around black history. Uh, we have a film series that kicks off next Sunday, no, Saturday, next Saturday, um, that we're going to be doing through the spring. And that's my colleague, Ania Ray, and our community engagement department put together a great series with Ralph Crowder, uh, who's a local historian, and uh, it's going to be a great series of all kinds of topics uh, in black history, including, I know one of the things that uh, our speaker today touches on is the role of the McDonald's in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. One of the films is going to be talking about what happened in Ferguson. And I think that one's in January. We also have a great exhibit that's opening in February, February 3rd, Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow. It's from the New York Historical Society. It's going to be opening. Uh, you'll hear more information about it coming up, but keep your eye out for it. And we're going to have some great programs to go along with that. Um, and as always, uh, check out our other programs. And uh, we have a lot of great stuff coming up, including stuff with local comic artists uh, in connection to our Life and Art of Charles M. Schultz exhibit that's running right now. Um, but you didn't hear me, you didn't come to hear me talk. So uh, before we get started, I do want to just make a note, and it's an important one, is that a reminder that we are. Uh, on the uh, traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. MNHS operates across the state of Minnesota. It's a state that shares its geography with 11 Dakota and Anishinaabe nations and has a, is, is home to many more indigenous people. We really value the relationships we have with our indigenous communities and nations here in Minnesota. And we do uh, a lot to really make sure that we are honoring that uh, uh, and uh, building trust with those communities that we're working towards healing. And uh, I have to say, our, our department at Native American Initiatives does amazing programming to really work towards that. Um, everything from uh, artists in residence programs where we, where we use our collections to allow Native artists to continue to further their work, their creative work, to we had a, a, a Native student college fair here just the other day where we had uh, hundreds of students coming to take a look higher ed opportunities, both tribal colleges and colleges across the country. Uh, it was pretty amazing to have that here. So uh, we encourage you to learn more and to find ways to connect with and support our indigenous uh, neighbors. But uh, today we're here to talk about franchise. And our speaker, Dr. Marsha Chatlin, is the Penn Presidential Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. That's a mouthful. That's a good title. Uh, she is the author of Franchise, Golden Arches in Black America. It won the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in history. It is also uh, racked up an impressive number of awards, as you can see there on the program. The Hagley Prize in Business History, the Organization of American Historians Lawrence Levine Award, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, the Hooks Institute National Book Award, the Alfred and Faye Chandler Book Award, and this is not something we usually get in history form, the James Beard Foundation Award for writing. We don't usually get historians who win awards from the James Beard Foundation. That's pretty terrific. She's also the author of Southside Girls, which relooks at the uh, great migration in Chicago from the lens of girls. And another little plug, we do have an exhibit coming up. Again, keep your eyes to it. It's a uh, girlhood. It's complicated from the Smithsonian that will be opening later the, uh, in 2024. So just a little plug, keep your, keep your eyes out for that. Um, but without further ado, please give a Minnesota welcome to Dr. Marsha Chatlin.
Thank you so much. It is Saturday morning. It is cold-ish. I guess it's not cold by your standards, but it is cold. And um, you've decided to spend some time thinking about history, so I appreciate that. And I just want to thank everyone uh, from the History Center and the Historical Society for the warm welcome. I love talking about history so much, <laughs> um, and so I'm excited to talk about franchise, but I kind of want to just say one thing about teaching history right now, teaching US history in the midst of a culture war. Um, you know, I um, had the pleasure and honor of attending the University of Missouri, a state institution, and then going off and uh, furthering my education uh, in graduate school. Uh, my first job was at the University of Oklahoma, and then after that I taught at Georgetown University, and now I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the things I've realized is that most of my students have a lot more in common than, um, than they don't have in common. And they're all on a journey to find out um, how do they understand what the truth is? How do they discern the information that they receive, whether it's from the places that they were born and grew up, from their families and their friends, from media, they just wanna kind of figure out how to understand knowledge, the production of knowledge and the truth. And at the start of my career, I didn't realize how easy that was because we took for granted in that particular period of time that there were some things that are real and some things that are false, and then we just operate under that paradigm. But today, because US history and the teaching of its fullness and richness has become such a contentious issue, it's hard to explain to students that we are engaged in a process not because of our political affiliations or our political alignments, it's because the telling of the truth is critically important for us as people. And so as supporters of history, um, I thank you for um, showing your support in engaging with ideas, some that are familiar, some that are new, supporting an institution like this that is trying to share that process with people at various points in their lives. And so um, I just was really kind of moved by that. And so thank you for spending Saturday learning something new from me. Um, so today's conversation um, starts with this guy and I think most people in the room are able to identify him, but in case you're wondering, uh, this is Bill Clinton. He was president of the United States. Um, you know, the th great thing about college teaching is that they stay the same age, but you get older. And so um, I was showing, I think I showed a picture of Dan Quayle, and I said, does everyone know who this is? They said, no. I said, really, no one knows who this is? I said, he was a vice president, and I was telling another historian that, and she goes, well, it's kind of the equivalent if someone you know, showed you a picture of Harry Truman's vice president. Would you know what he looked like? And it, it set me into an existential spiral. But anyway, <laughs> so this guy was president of the United States, and for those of you who remember when he ran for president, images like this were um, commonplace in the coverage of Bill Clinton, and it would be Bill Clinton jogging to a McDonald's picking up some McDonald's with Secret Service and eating it. And there's a very um, famous Saturday Night Live skit where the late Phil Hartman plays Bill Clinton eating french fries off of trays of you know, constituents while he's talking about you know, enterprise zones and his policy on healthcare. And so part of this characterization of Bill Clinton was about the generation that he represented as the first boomer president. But one of the things that I think is really fascinating about Bill Clinton's relationship to fast food is how it fit within a structure of stereotypes of Bill Clinton. And one of the writers who noticed this was Toni Morrison. And you may remember in 2008 when Barack Obama ran for president, there was this line that people would um, rehash that Toni Morrison called Bill Clinton America's first black president. But a lot of people didn't understand the essay that it came from. That's why you always have to go back to the sources. And it was an essay from the Talk of the Town feature in The New Yorker. And what she was talking about was the congressional um, hearings for the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And she said in many ways, the ways that Congress was pursuing Bill Clinton was reminiscent of the ways that a racially biased justice system 
sometimes pursues African Americans. And she said, after all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor working class, saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. And so the ways that Toni Morrison maps fast food onto the racialization of Bill Clinton was really fascinating to me. We know that everyone eats fast food in the US, it's available everywhere, but what necessarily makes McDonald's black? And in thinking about that question, I started to think about the ways that McDonald's emerged in African American communities. There was nothing inevitable about that story, considering McDonald's was really a creation of mid-century suburbanization, a history that we understand was foundational to America's racial divide in where people lived and where they socialized. So how does McDonald's become black? Once you start um, asking yourselves questions like that as a historian, you see it everywhere. And so when I started working on this book, I wanted to write a book about food in the civil rights movement. And so I wanted to think about, for instance, the work of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in creating food cooperatives in Mississippi. I was thinking about the people who worked on New York City's um, human rights commissions, and they would try to challenge segregation laws in New York City diners. So I came up with this book proposal, and I showed it to an editor, and she says, wow, this is incredibly boring. But this chapter, <laughs> she was a little bit nicer, but not that much nicer about it. Um, but she said, but one of the chapters was about fast food advertising, particularly African-American advertising and McDonald's. And she said, but you know, this McDonald's thing is kind of interesting. Think about that. And when I went back to the drawing board, everywhere I went, I saw this connection. And this was emerging in the summer of 2014, when the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri had become international news after um, Officer Darren Wilson uh, shot and killed Michael Brown, a teenager in Ferguson, Missouri. And like many people, I was glued to uh, cable television at this time, watching the news unfold. As a graduate of the University of Missouri and someone who spent many years in the state teaching high school and visiting friends and staying connected to my alma mater, I thought it was really fascinating that a town like Ferguson, um, and for people who are not from the Midwest, I think they have a hard time imagining these um, not quite suburban but exurban towns that are both proximate to big cities, but very disconnected um, financially and socially and politically um, from these places. And as I've uh, taught on the East Coast for over a decade, a lot of my students have never been to the Midwest, which I think is the greatest failing of their education. So you say, anyone? And then they'll say, they'll say, I've been to Pennsylvania. Is that the Midwest? <laughs> It's a shame. That's the real scandal on America's college campuses, the number of kids who've never been to the Midwest. But nonetheless, you know, watching Ferguson, Missouri um, as the center of this conversation about America's unfinished business of racial justice um, made me think a lot about McDonald's because often the news coverage centered on the parking lot of this McDonald's location on fluorescent um, Avenue, which is a black-owned McDonald's in Ferguson, and I thought about images like this, and this is from Washington, D.C. in 1968, shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis on April 4th, and this idea that in the midst of this chaos, where does McDonald's fit in? In Ferguson, it was one of the few businesses that was able to remain open during the weeks of unrest, and in 1968, what I discovered was this was the moment that McDonald's had made a concerted effort to open in African-American neighborhoods. So what is it about racial unrest that draws the magnet of the fast food industry into black America? And if we wanted to think about the history of post-1968 civil rights, could we do it by looking at McDonald's? One of my... Um, great uh, challenges and great opportunities in teaching African-American history is to find a way for students to find a common reference point, regardless of their own backgrounds, into understanding a complex history that they may not have had much exposure to. And I don't think of, I can't think of a better way to talk about America's racial past than an institution that most, if not all of us, 
have had some experience of, and that is McDonald's. Though, occasionally, I will go to an event and someone will say they have never been to a McDonald's. Is there anyone in this room who has never been to a McDonald's? In which case, I will sit down and you give the lecture and I'll ask you <laughs> questions. One time, I did um, a Zoom presentation uh, during the height of COVID to a group of folks from New York and I said, has anyone never you know, had McDonald's? And two people, I think they were under 30, said we didn't. One was raised vegan, and the other one was um, raised by a nutritionist. They'd never been to a McDonald's. I was so distracted and fascinated by them. I almost, I almost just said, we need to end. So we all have a sense of what a McDonald's is. We all have a position on it. Um, and so there were a few things that um, I had to understand before I could write this book. And that was fast food franchising which is really fascinating. So there's approximately 250,000 fast food restaurants in the United States, um, and that is about a third of the general fast food business market in the U US, which is about um, three quarters of a million um, businesses. And when we think about franchising, we often think about the fast food industry, but franchising has become um, commonplace across many sectors, whether it's staying at a Hampton Inn on a vacation or going to a FedEx Kinko's, getting your oil changed at a Midas. Um, there's even franchises of healthcare providers. Some of those quick service urgent cares operate like franchises. And the business model is really fascinating. Um, in my book, I talk about it. It's as if um, you're in a family where the parents make all the rules, but the children earn all the money. Um, it's a business that I think really encapsulates the idea of the American dream, that if you just follow a script and you follow the rules and regulations and the blueprint, you can become very successful. But over the course of this research and being engaged in some of the public policy questions around franchising, it's a very risky business that um, for some have been, has been very exploitative. Um, we know that some of the national brands that have a very low um, cost of entry, if, you know, the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. They often are attracting uh, new immigrants, uh, working class people who pool their resources to open these businesses, and they have a very hard time maintaining them. So franchising really explodes in the U.S. at mid-century. A lot of celebrities. Uh, start to lend their name to franchising, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And people are thinking, how do I become my own boss? We know so much of our political rhetoric in the US is this idea of Main Street, right? The business owner as the backbone of the economy, and franchising is able to exploit some of those ideas while still maintaining a stronghold over these people who frame themselves as independent owners. And so within the McDonald's system, McDonald's franchisees are called operators. So the first um, task that I had in telling the story was to rethink our origin story of McDonald's. For many of you who read business um, histories or have read biographies of folks like Ray Kroc, we think of McDonald's as this um, stellar example of innovation in food delivery and marketing, which it absolutely is. But one of the things that I wanted to do was to tell the racial history of McDonald's. And when we look at it through the lens of racial exclusion in African American history, it's a very different story. Um, the McDonald's brothers were from New Hampshire. They grew up during the Great Depression. They started to look west for their fortunes. They go to California. They have a number of failed business ideas. They're trying to run a movie theater. They're trying to work in Hollywood. Um, there was an early experimentation. I don't know how well you can see um, the menu in barbecue. It's a bad idea. Um, but, they, but they realized that their success will come in the fast delivery of hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes. And as the story goes, Ray Kroc was a um, milkshake mixer salesman. He sees this incredible business, and he purchases McDonald's for $2 million, and the rest is history. Um, but what is often missing in the story of McDonald's is the fact that all of the structures that um, allow fast food to flourish 
are based on racial exclusion, whether it's the formation of the highway systems, which eviscerated many black neighborhoods across the country, whether we think about um, the creation of the bedroom suburbs for um, economically um, mobile families to be able to live in uh, racially segregated housing. Um, if we think about the fact that a number of returning veterans from World War II under the GI Bill were able to access business loans to enter franchising. When we think about the inequalities of the delivery of the GI Bill, we often think about the residential segregation. We might think of the fact that a number of black veterans returned um, with a deep desire to go to college, but they were confronted with state university systems that were segregated. But the business loan mechanism is also another part of it. And this is why, if you look at the early years of McDonald's franchising, a lot of the men who get involved were World War II veterans and were able to access GI Bill funding for that. So all of this is to say that, as a result, McDonald's is strangely removed from our history of civil rights agitation around segregation. One of the things I was really surprised to find were the number of times McDonald's was a target of groups like the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for their segregation practices in the South. When we think about the great sit-in movement um, that was ignited in 1960 but started earlier, we think of brands that are no longer with us, whether it's Woolworths, Rexall Drugs, to an extent is not with us, um, Katz's Drugs. McDonald's is rarely in that frame. But when I started to look at the archives of major civil rights organizations, McDonald's was sharply in um, that target area of businesses that practice segregation in the South. So in retelling a civil rights history of McDonald's, we're able to see the ways that this institution was able to grow based on racial exclusion and then remove itself from a critical part of American civil rights history. And I think a large part of that had to do with what happened after 1968. So the second chapter of my book looks at this period of time um, that, I, that I call Burgers in the Age of Black Capitalism. And immediately after King's assassination, McDonald's had the challenge of having a number of restaurants in urban areas in which white franchise owners were concerned that they would be targets of another racial uprising or community animus about their presence. And so McDonald's allowed some of these franchisees to leave the urban areas and move to the suburbs. And in their place, they put in black franchise owners. And the recruitment of black franchise owners was something that McDonald had talked about prior to 1968, but immediately after King's assassination to protect its investments in cities like Chicago and Washington, DC, and promote this idea that McDonald's would be joining other corporations that were looking at how to expand opportunities, McDonald's comes to African American neighborhoods. And again, as a historian, you might see something a million times and then one day you understand its significance. This is a plaque outside of McDonald's in the Woodlawn neighborhood of Chicago. My sister used to live a few blocks away from this McDonald's. I'm sure I've eaten here several times. And um, it wasn't until I started this project that I realized that it had a plaque outside that says, um, on November or on December 21st, 1968, this location was franchised to the first McDonald's African American owner operator. It is not a coincidence that this location um, is reopened eight months after King's assassination. And in fact, this is a pattern that a number of um, black franchise owners saw. Properties that were no longer of interest or no longer considered profitable for white franchise owners were turned over to black franchisees. And we know that this practice was something that happened across urban areas in different ways, whether it's the conversion of churches because of racial de demographic changes or the conversion of residential areas, the same thing was happening in the fast food sector. And throughout this time, I, I try to explain this to my students, um, and my metaphors are really bad, but this is the best that I have. From the vantage point of 1968, for someone to give men like these men, and in the center of this picture is the first black franchise owner, Herman Petty, to say to these men in 1968, we're going to give you an opportunity to franchise a McDonald's, 
would be similar to if Mark Zuckerberg called me right now and said, you know what, I've been thinking, you should own Meta and you should own Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram. I think you should do it. And I would say, well, I think you're right. Um, I would get off the phone and not quite sh be sure what I walked into, but to start to imagine um, the access to power and the wealth associated with that kind of brand would be really overwhelming. And so I think that I often say, you know, McDonald's is the first publicly traded fast food company. And in 1968, it wasn't the largest, but it was the most innovative in terms of um, marketing and its growth. And for African Americans who had been systematically and historically cut out of business, for someone to say, you can have a piece of this is really overwhelming. You know, a lot of the debates about this particular era of civil rights was about whether or not capitalism was the place in which African Americans should invest their time. And there's a lot of criticism and there's a lot of counter um, points made about whether business was going to be the future of the struggle. You know, um, it is no coincidence, I think, that on the precipice of this moment, Martin Luther King Jr. is working on the Poor People's Campaign and he's talking about economic justice and his op opposition to the Vietnam War wasn't just as a pacifist but as someone who was very concerned about social spending and the ways that the poor would be ignored. You know, he is ushering in this conversation that after his assassination um, becomes less and less relevant to the choices that civil rights organizations are making. During this period of time, McDonald's has a direct line to the NAACP core, the Urban League, as well as King's own Southern Christian Leadership Conference in promoting fast food franchising as an economic vehicle in African American neighborhoods. It's going to create jobs, it's going to allow for a sense of ownership and economic mobility. And by our vantage point in 2023, we can say, well, people were so foolish to believe this, but I think it's important to consider the fact that we know the future and other people didn't. But more than anything else, the sheer exhaustion that people had felt by 1968 in seeing the legislative victories that came out of um, you know, the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, um, the hopefulness that had emerged from the Brown v. Board decision on school desegregation, and the reality of continued divestment in black communities, as well as the inability to realize the kind of social promises of the war on poverty. And so the pivot to business for some people felt like the next rational step in the freedom movement, and others were concerned about the alliance of the civil rights um, leadership with corporate America, particularly McDonald's. And so as McDonald's is pursuing this urban strategy, they are running up against some real challenges to it. And I think that this is a really important story to tell because we probably can't imagine a world without McDonald's, but in 1970, McDonald's did not have the reach that it has today and many communities had not experienced yet. And so I talk about McDonald's growing pains in trying to build trust with African American communities. And the resistance looks different in different parts of the country. But in Cleveland, Ohio, where um, Carl Stokes was elected mayor, um, McDonald's becomes a real problem for him. So Carl Stokes is often credited as the first black, ma uh, black mayor of a major city. Um, he wins under a special election and he's running for re-election in 1972, and things are looking pretty good until um, a group called Operation Black Unity mounts a protest against Cleveland's um, East Side McDonald's. And their argument against McDonald's is not the arguments that we've seen before. For instance, in the South, when McDonald's was a target uh, uh, around the issue of segregation, the issue in Cleveland was McDonald's is serving black customers but McDonald's is not black owned in Cleveland. And this group wanted to get McDonald's to remove white owners and replace them with black owners and then use the McDonald's as a kind of philanthropic tool in the community. McDonald's should pay for a community playground, a community pool, they should be accountable to the community. And this is in the period of time before the script on corporate social responsibility was just so slick. This is before the kind of 
um, engagement with communities that we expect from corporations. Um, and so McDonald's is really irritated because they don't want to concede this point to this group in Cleveland because they know that they're going to continue their expansion in black neighborhoods. And so if they give in to Cleveland, what's going to happen in Chicago? What's going to happen in Detroit? And so on and so forth. And so what you see is this coalition of African American groups that have a very different idea of what does it mean for there to be corporate responsibility in black communities. And what I found really fascinating about this particular conflict was you start to see the emergence of black political leadership who have to deal with McDonald's as a serious variable in their um, relationship to the larger community. One of the questions that I often get um, about the book is if McDonald's opened their archives to me, the answer is no, absolutely not. Um, I asked and they said no. They do have their own um, in-house historian and he sent me a lovely email explaining that I'm not gonna get access to their records. But I really do think that was a blessing in disguise because if I'm telling a civil rights story of McDonald's, then there have to be places in which McDonald's appear in an archive um, in a civil rights context. And what I discovered was McDonald's was everywhere, but particularly in the papers of black mayors. Uh, Tom Bradley in Los Angeles, um, Maynard Young in Atlanta, um, uh, Carl Stokes in Cleveland, Harold Washington in Chicago, and so on and so forth. Not only because black franchise owners were very successful, many of them were black millionaires in their community, they were major donors to these campaigns, but McDonald's wanted to continue to expand into these neighborhoods and they had to ally themselves with black political representation. And so as the story continued, I found all sorts of opposition to McDonald's, again, based on different arguments. So some people were arguing for an ownership stake that the larger community could benefit from. And others just felt like McDonald's just needed to be a good neighbor. So this picture um, is from Portland, Oregon, and the picture on the book is also from Portland, Oregon, in which there was a conflict in, between McDonald's and predominantly black neighborhood folks in the 1970s over the issue of donations to the Black Panther Party for self-defense and their free breakfast program for children. Community members really didn't care who owned a McDonald's, but they felt like if you're in this neighborhood, you need to contribute to the free breakfast program. And McDonald's, the local McDonald's owner refused. And so there is a conflict, and then there is a bombing, and there are a lot of accusations as to who is responsible for the bombing. You have to get the book to find out what happened. <laughs> um, but more importantly, you start to see the way that McDonald's is becoming this kind of object to work out feelings about empowerment and community control. So this is Kent Ford, who was the head of the Black Panther Party in Portland and his free breakfast program. Um, you see similar types of um, conflicts between black communities and um, McDonald's in Philadelphia in the Ogons neighborhood, where the position against McDonald's wasn't anti-fast food and it wasn't about ownership. It was feeling that the city council wasn't listening to local people about what they needed. You know, the argument was, we have enough fast food restaurants. We have pollution. We have all of this litter. We have all of these cars. We need mental health services. We need a library. We need actual resources in our community. Um, and as these conflicts are being mediated, McDonald's is nervous because the other strategy um, is a number of African-American celebrities start creating their own rival brands. And the argument is McDonald's is telling you that you can go to a black-owned McDonald's, but it's not a black-owned company. But you can buy and you can invest in real black-owned companies like Muhammad Ali's Champ Burger. And this is a real picture from Miami, the opening of Champ Burger. And Champ Burger advertised itself as a business that churches and mosques and community groups could invest in and use the um, profits to reinvest in local communities. Similarly, um, uh, gospel great Mahalia Jackson created a fried chicken restaurant called Mahalia Jackson's Glory Fried Chicken. Um, the restaurants looked like churches <laughs> and they played her music in the background. Um, and all of these 
authentically black owned uh, fast food restaurants were challenging this idea of McDonald's as a force for community good. I will spoil this, these companies were not black owned. What they were, were white owned companies that had um, basically um, leased the image and likeness of these celebrities. And this gets exposed in a number of ways as well. But this idea that fast food would be the future for black economic progress was so powerful that this very short period of time, you see these uh, corporate memos that say, you know, uh, figure out the Cleveland situation because Mahalia Jackson's was pitching this week in the community and we don't want to lose this market share. So there's this incredible competition for the black consumer market and there are many ways to look at this and I'll return to this in a second. Um, I couldn't really write a book about McDonald's without talking about marketing and talking about advertising and the ways that McDonald's so skillfully advertised to African Americans especially in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, the archive of these advertisements are largely from a Chicago-based firm called Burrell Communications, and they were really the leader in African-American marketing um, from the six, late 60s until the early 2000s. Um, and some of these ads from the hindsight of 2023 are kind of embarrassing or uncomfortable. Um, and some of them have been, um, critiqued for drawing upon uh, racial stereotypes about African Americans and dining culture. But one of the things I talk about is how important this advertising is if we consider that legally, African Americans enjoying public accommodations is very young in the nation in 1972 and 1974. That the federal protection to be in a restaurant and to be served is only a decade old in 1974. And when McDonald's is making an appeal to black diners, they're saying, you don't have to worry about how you'll be treated here. Um, you know, a lot of these ads are, it doesn't cost that much, you don't have to worry about tipping, come as you are. And that essentially means that the racial trauma and the horrors of trying to access dining, that's gone. It's going to be consistent and it's going to be an easy time for you and your family. And I think that this is a really important messaging. Even though we think of um, fast food today as not very special, considering um, the lack of access to discretionary income and just the dining practices of people in the 1970s, going to McDonald's is a very big deal. Um, when I started my book tour in 2020, I, I had a stop in Kansas City, and then an African American woman in her 70s said, I remember the first time I went to McDonald's because I, was, I went on a date and got ice cream, and it was so special because I had grown up in the Deep South, and my grandma wouldn't let us go to the local ice cream shop because they had a whites only and a colored window. So we weren't allowed to go there, and we always had homemade ice cream. And she said, when I moved to Kansas City, it was the first time I had gone out for ice cream, and it was so important to me. And those are the types of experiences that I think that um, as someone who's incredibly critical of the fast food industry and critical of McDonald's, it's also important for me to recognize and appreciate that every institution has some type of imprint on us, whether we like it or not. And to take seriously what this meant for black consumers in the 1970s is to really add the layer, I think, of empathy that we all need to do um, when we do historical research. Uh, one of the things I found that McDonald's was one of the very early corporate supporters of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. This is always something that surprises my students when I try to explain to them that the King holiday was incredibly controversial when it was passed um, as a federal holiday in 1983. Um, my former colleague uh, from the University of Oklahoma, um, David Chappelle, wrote an excellent book about um, you know, the lead up to the King holiday and the years after King's assassination. And he writes about how, you know, on the floor of Congress, they're debating whether or not, you know, King was a communist and he was a plagiarist and he was this horrible person for America and should he have a King holiday? You know, and they're saying this to Coretta Scott King as she's advocating for it. And there were recommendations that maybe it should be a Frederick Douglass day or someone else, you know? And so the, um, the lionization of Martin Luther King Jr. is such a recent phenomenon phenomenon that what I thought was really fascinating and largely I think because of the success McDonald's had in the African American community and the work of its franchise owners, they are supporting the King holiday. McDonald's and Coca-Cola are invested very early. Um, similarly, 
McDonald's has underwritten a lot of black um, cultural forms, whether it's the you know McDonald's gospel tour for gospel music, the creation of the All-American Double Dutch League, which um, uh, groups of young people who appeared in their commercials, and then in the pre-internet age, the All-American basketball game, which was how a lot of top players were recruited, were all of these kind of gestures to African-American culture and talent that I think was really, really important for the brand's um, incredible success with African-American consumers. And as the book looks into the period of the 1980s, I talk about the really complicated strategy of creating these black franchise locations as a way to try to create not only brand loyalty, but economic development by looking at a series of conflicts that start in the 1970s, but really take shape in the 80s about access to franchises. So there's a case that comes out of the 1980s where um, a black franchise owner named Charles Griffiths claims that he is being racially redlined in franchise locations. He says that if you're African American, you can get locations in predominantly black areas, but you can't expand. And one of the things that I've learned from franchisees is that volume is the name of the game. You want to have a lot of restaurants in order to maximize your opportunity, but you have to petition McDonald's. This allegation is an allegation that continues to the present day. Uh, there was a major um, legal case mounted by more than 50 black franchise owners who argue for the same issue of redlining. But in the 1980s, it was interesting, the claim of redlining, McDonald's response was, well, don't you want to do business in your own community? And the retort was, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> um, you know, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, that is my community, not South Los Angeles. So, you know, what gives? But it's a really, it's a really interesting conversation about a moment that I think could have been far more valuable in terms of the intervention of organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP. Because a lot of these conflicts around fast food and the issue of racially restrictive redlining was negotiated to create more black franchise owners. And I think it happened at the expense of the workers because a lot of it was about how many people can own how many locations. And so this is where you see the entry of a lot of black millionaires who are investing in more restaurants. And this also contributes to the oversaturation of fast food locations in predominantly African American neighborhoods. So while more franchise owners were brought into the system and franchise owners were able to acquire more properties, the bottom line issues of workers were never really engaged around these racial justice issues. And leading the charge during this time is Operation Push, head by, headed by um, Jesse Jackson, the National Action Network by Reverend Al Sharpton, and they are going back and forth around this issue, not just at McDonald's, but the other legacy fast food brands. And so the book ends with another moment of racial unrest and this time from Los Angeles in 1992. And one of the early pieces that um, started me on this journey to write this book came from an article about the 1992 Los Angeles uprising after the acquittal of the four officers in the beating of Rodney King, which many of us remember was one of the first times um, because of the technology of uh, video recording, we were able to see repeatedly, right, this moment of, um, of, of police abuse. And after the uprising quieted down that week in May in Los Angeles, McDonald's circulated a um, press release. And they said that after a week of you know, disarray in Los Angeles, none of our locations were targets of violence. And that is a reflection of our socially conscious investment in the African American community that started 25 years earlier in 1968. It's such a bizarre and outrageous claim from my perspective, in my opinion. I thought it was such a strange thing to read. And it's not only strange to read the press release, but it's also strange how often um, black franchise owners told me that story. 
Business historians have told me that story. Um, if you read any kind of um, edited book or textbook on corporate social responsibility, that story will appear. And it's this idea that McDonald's um, had been so aligned with black community values and uh, local people that in this moment of pure um, rage and feelings of injustice, McDonald's was protected. I became obsessed with this idea. So I went to California and it was such a sunny day. And you know, coming from the Midwest, I don't take sunlight uh, you know, lightly, but I went into a library and I read the commission reports after the Los Angeles uprising, just looking. And it wasn't digitized, yes. And that's why we have to give money for digitization. <laughs> um, you know, I'm looking through this and it's, it's, it's not accurate. They were McDonald's that had been targeted, but McDonald's, unlike the local mom and pop shop, have more resources to clean up glass and reopen. There was also a McDonald's that was at the center of a lot of um, the chaos that was also a staging ground for the National Guard. And the McDonald's was supplying food to the people who had been deployed out there. So then I, then, you know, then the obsession got even deeper. So then I started to look at the immediate newspaper reports and there were pictures of damaged McDonald's. And what I realized was the story didn't have to be completely accurate that the process of aligning McDonald's with um, the black freedom struggle, its presence in African-American communities from not just a product development standpoint, but a philanthropic uh, standpoint, made the story believable in a way that allowed it to um, distinguish itself relative to other corporations and other targets during this time and try to reify and a narrative and an idea about McDonald's being on the right side of history. And so what I hope my book has been able to do in this larger conversation is to, to really reflect on an idea that comes from Ella Baker, one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, that she says, you know, when we talk about the issue of the lunch counter, it has to be bigger than a hamburger. That when we talk about nutrition, when we talk about health, discourses about obesity and healthy eating and what people should or shouldn't eat, we often lose sight of the ways that history can be a valuable tool of analysis. A hamburger doesn't appear in a community overnight by magic. It is a process of drawing upon histories of exclusion. It's about drawing upon fantasies about capitalism's ability to nourish and to convene communities. It is about a kind of relationship to the marketplace that as much as we don't like it is very real, that when we talk about public health interventions or the crisis of inequality, we have to think about how we got there. And so whether it is you know, Michelle Obama's platform about children needing to move and to make healthy food choices, or the struggle to pay fast food workers a living wage, all of this is encapsulated by incredibly complicated stories of the past. And what I hope Franchise is able to do is to remind historians that we have a role to play in the discourse and to remind all the policymakers, all of the people who are tasked with solving today's problems that the past is really necessary and understanding and appreciation of it in order to move forward. And with that, I thank you for being such a great audience. And I invite you to ask questions. I don't know anyone's name, so I will not just call on you. Um, so you'll have to raise your hand and please use the microphone. Thank you. We've got a question right here. Uh, this may be somewhat off topic, but uh, that photograph of Bill Clinton at the, at the McDonald's brings me to present times with Donald Trump mm -hmm. ordering sacks full of McDonald's to be delivered to court. And um, not at all uh, Toni Morrison's list of the, the black trope. And I'm just wondering if you looked at that image and had any thoughts or comments about it. Yes, I always have thoughts and comments on Donald Trump. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think, I, I think about this a lot because um, a lot of what I'm engaging with 
is um, public culture in the 80s, particularly around wealth and business. And Donald Trump, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, growing up in the 80s, I don't know if I knew what his business was, but he was a rich person on television. So a lot of his public presentation, you know, when I was a kid, was about how wealthy he was from something I don't know what. Um, and, you know, my friends from New York, you know, knew kind of more um, the many faces of Donald Trump. But I think growing up in the Midwest, you would see him on that uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. He, you know, he has a gold toilet, so I guess he's important. You know, just it's just this kind of weird, ostentatious look at wealth. But I think that this is important for a number of reasons. Um, I think that part of what Donald Trump represented was not that different from Bill Clinton in the sense that a person can gain certain types of capital and still be a real person. That um, the era of, you know, the transition from the kind of Carter presidency, Clinton presidency, Obama to some extent, but I don't think he was very good at the kind of folksiness that, Cl I mean, Clinton's a, the, the king of the folksy. And then Trump, it's all about this idea that there is a person who should have social distance from the rest of us because of their wealth or their level of education, but there's something about them that allows us to meet in the middle. And I think fast food does that, right? Um, there's a fascination with wealthy or famous people eating fast food that's indexed to this idea that if you could have anything in the world, you can have anything in the world, but this is what you want. The thing that I like is the thing that you like, and there's something endearing about that. Now, um, I think he actually does eat fast food. I don't think it's a, you know, it's a bit. He actually does like it. Um, and I think that is supposed to be reflective of this way that this alleged billionaire likes the thing that I like too. So I think that works for his kind of imaging. The other thing that I do think is fascinating is when um, Donald Trump ordered a bunch of fast food for the, who won the national championship that year? Was it, was it Clemson? No, it was uh, LSU. When the football players come and they're like super hungry and they're gonna come eat at the White House and it's a bunch of reheated fast food. It's biz so then that behavior is just really bizarre. But I think again, it plays into this idea of um, I'm gonna say something and I'm gonna really mean it. One of the consequences of access and um, the democratization of institutions, the response is sometimes degrading the institution itself. I think that after Barack Obama became the first black president, there was an effort to, to degrade the presidency because he had been president. And I don't think anyone best, like the best representative of that is in the treatment of the White House by the Trump White House, right? Being president is not a big deal. Being president's not special. The White House isn't special. You come to the White House, if anyone's ever had the experience of touring the White House or going to a White House event, there's nothing more spectacular. Um, recently I had, through the History Channel, I was able to go to the White House for a concert with Elton John. It was the most elegant night of my life. You know, the Marine Corps band is like playing music and it's everything is so beautiful and so stunning, right? Every dream you would have of going to the White House is there. And under the Trump administration, the White House becomes something of no value. And I don't think that's coincidental. So I think the fast food stuff is not just a kind of personal affinity, but I think that it, it's used in this way to both connect, but to also degrade. My question is, after all the work you've done on both McDonald's, uh, within and without the black community, do you view McDonald's as exploitive of the black community or an early great source of generational wealth for the black community? I, I think that McDonald's um, is, 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 is all of these things at once. I think McDonald's is a missed opportunity in the sense that um, I, don't, I don't, you know, harshly look at people who had no entry point into American business and get this opportunity. I, that would be ridiculous for me to be, um, you know, to, to, to wag my finger at people who had been shut out completely and get this entryway and pathway. What I do, um, what concerns me the most is that McDonald's engagement with African American communities is misinterpreted as 
anything other than um, the, the unfolding of capitalism and business. This is business, all of it is business. It's not philanthropy, it's not community investment, it's not service, it's business. And if we just call it business and leave it alone, then it pushes us to think about expansive ways of actually doing the work that needs to be done. So my concern is, is that, you know, McDonald's would say, well, we've created a, a black leadership class of millionaires who then use their fortunes and they donate. That's not a sustainable approach to economic injustice. It's nice, right? It's a choice. But I'm more concerned about uh, an environment without the legislative and political will and without the regulation that we have to depend on McDonald's to be the nice guy. Right? I don't want communities to rise on fall based on how burgers are doing in sales. I want there to be structures for people to just kind of live good lives regardless of what their jobs are, and then you can enjoy a hamburger. I love a hamburger. But what I love more is to maybe live in a world where the safety net is strong enough that communities are not tying their future and their hopes on whether a new business comes in, because I think that this is part of the dangerous thinking that we saw after, you know, in 2020, after the George Floyd uprising. The number of businesses that say that they were gonna make investments, but the types of investments they were making were, were kind of secondary, secondary to the point, you know? Like, George Floyd's life isn't saved by companies making these types of commitments. It just isn't, right? And so we can understand that and we can say that they have a responsibility, but at the end of the day, we have a structure and mechanism for care and that's our, our, our common good. And so what, I, what scares me about this story is how often it's repeated that we give up on this idea that we have a common good and we see which business makes the most money and gives us some back you know, this kind of rebate system of economic development. And I would also say, you know, with all my criticisms of groups like the NAACP and the Urban League getting involved in this practice, they are broke in the 1970s. They are being sued by the entities that they pursued around civil rights issues in the 1960s, and this was their method of survival. So everyone is making the best choice under a constrained set of circumstances and I understand that, and this should then push our imagination even you know, further to think about how do we prevent this from being the primary strategy for some type of economic and social relief. I agree with much of what you said about business, uh, and they, we, wish we had a business community that was more interested in the common good. But I do like to call your attention, I think you mentioned it a little while ago, that business expansion, although it's based upon where can we expand our business, you know, and increase our, our net worth, it is also <laughs> ironically uh, symmetrical with, in, encouraging and lifting economic status of various communities. So for example, you will see in the entertainment business and on the uh, commercial television stations, a lot of focus on black entertainment because it is enjoyed by many people of all backgrounds. And this in turn is indicated shown in our advertising mm -hmm. that more and more Afro-American people are then featured in ads, which then kind of sublimates into the whole population as, you know, these are people of distinction, this is a mm -hmm. group of value to our community. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. You know, um, when, when <laughs> one of uh, my best and worst research days, I went to the Paley Library in New York City and they're an archive of all sorts of media and they have these, um, I think they're on VHS tape of just McDonald's commercials, you know, starting from the 70s into the 90s. It's my entire childhood. I just sat there and cried. I'm like, why am I so emotional? Because it's deeply affective, right? They show the, the, the Olympics version of McDonald's commercials, the ones about the first day of school. They're so 
well done. And I always tell my students, anytime you think you're smarter than you know, advertisers, advertisers will show you just how much smarter they are than you. You will get sucked in. But one of the things that is important to understand in that history with McDonald's is that uh, originally, they wanted to do the kind of segmented marketing that we're familiar with, right? So African American models and you know um, and characters in 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 commercials, and they would broadcast on black television and black radio. And then they started to understand that there were certain people who were famous enough that they could be considered kind of across the board campaigns. And Michael Jordan was definitely it in the 1980s. As someone growing up in Chicago, I don't know if I could ever you know fully explain to my students just how famous he was, right? And Michael Jordan doing McDonald's commercials just kind of, and, and, and um, representing Nike, that was a huge moment for African-American athletes to market products. There were other people who had done so before, but in that way, it was kind of unbelievable. And McDonald's, I think, was very much part of leading that. Um, but what's interesting about that market segmentation it also brought a lot of celebrities and a lot of athletes into the franchising business. So there had been a long relationship between um, high net worth individuals investing in fast food as well. And so this becomes part of the tension of whether the franchise is an opportunity for people who may have done well at a corporate job and took a risk and went into franchising, and what does it mean for the hyper wealthy to get this experience as part of a large portfolio. Um, but you know, the, the advertising, the marketing um, history was really important for me to appreciate what that did because it wasn't just the creation of images that African-American consumers could relate to, it's the fact that it employed so many people. Um, you know, a lot of the pathway into television and film directing is to make commercials. African-American um, filmmakers started doing McDonald's commercials, backup singers, dancers, makeup artists. I mean, there's a whole culture industry that McDonald's is part of that I really had to spend some time to think about because I think I underestimated just how strong McDonald's was in underwriting black cultural forms that would have maybe disappeared had McDonald's not been part of that. And a lot of it was the franchise owners really pushing for that, and a lot of it was financed by the franchise owners themselves. But I think that they're, um, but again, I have to ask a question about my own um, first robust experience of African American history was because something was sponsored by a McDonald's. I don't like that, right? I, I, want us, I want us to have kind of access to cultural forms that are, that are state and community driven, but the reality is that I'm really grateful for the McDonald's funded opportunity to start learning more about African American history. Um, but you know, when we have the opportunity for it to look a little different, I think we should embrace it. Uh, two questions on uh, two different topics. Mm -hmm. The role of the McDonald's historian and how that comes into play. And secondly, could you talk a little bit about the James Beard Award, please? Oh. And yes. congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a lot of our big corporations, they employ historians to maintain their archives. And, you know, doing corporate history um, is always a challenge for historians. When you get access, sometimes it comes at a price. There's some people who have done excellent corporate histories. Um, one person's book that I can recommend is Bart Elmore's book about the history of Monsanto. Um, and the, the name is escaping me, but not a lot of people have written histories of Monsanto. And you know, he talks about how it moves from a chemical company to a technical tech company. It's so interesting. And he had access. Um, he also wrote his first book called um, Co-Capitalism about Coca-Cola. And you know, there's all of these questions as to what that relationship is like. Um, I'm glad that I didn't have to navigate a relationship with McDonald's in that way. But I had to be really mindful. I did talk to some black franchise owners. Um, and I wanted to be really respectful of that balance of saying, you know, I'm going to write something that is critical of an institutional structure, but not critical of you as a person who's, you know, part of this. Um, and so, you know, the research is interesting because a lot of McDonald's material is just in the archives of black organizations. You know, this could have been a much longer book if it was just archivally driven because McDonald's had to lobby all of the heavy hitters in civil rights to try to get black franchise ownership on the agenda. Um, they make an appearance at 
um, at events like the Black Expo, which is founded by Jesse Jackson as a economic investment tool. Um, you know, down in Atlanta, there's a lot of records of McDonald's engagement with civil rights groups and these protests about McDonald's presence. They're everywhere. And of course, right after I published the book, I found out there was a huge fight in Kansas City over McDonald's. This is a feature of this period. Um, the James Beard Awards were probably really great. I did not go. Um, one of the, so it's interesting. So 2020 was a hard year for everyone in the whole world. Uh, 2021 was an incredible year um, because of the success of franchise, um, but it was also the year that we adopted our son. And so it's 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 interesting because you know I was at home with a baby for most of 2021, um, and so I watched the James Beard Awards on streaming uh, with my son, and in celebration, he threw his dinner on the floor. <laughs> so he's, so he's, this is the closest you're gonna get to the buffet at the James Beard Board. I hear it's really nice, um, but I think, I think more importantly, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about food writing. So I didn't really think that, you know, my book would be considered food writing, but I think there are a group of people who really want to help us understand our relationship to the industry. So it was really exciting that this group of people who aren't as emerged in civil rights history or emerged in the literature could appreciate what it could say about the world of food. You opened up the door there a little bit with food. Did your research take you a little bit into the negative possible health effects of fast food in um, poor areas, whether it's African American or just urban poor areas. You know, I I I make a little mention of that. I really um, I really wanted to not engage that so much because other people have done it with better tools and skills. Um, you know, I talk a little bit about the concerns about projection in terms of you know rates of obesity and um, you know the public health concern around fast food really emerges around the time that uh, David Satcher is um, Surgeon General and we're starting to talk more about, um, what do they call them, the, the bad fats, um, triglycerides. And you know, prior to that, people aren't really talking about the health issues around fast food because there wasn't, there was, there was an assumption that people weren't gonna, were going to eat it that often, and it was when um, these African American owned franchises start to um, open that McDonald's corporate notices that people are eating there multiple times a day. So they take note that people are eating there a lot, but they often attribute it to the fact that there aren't a lot of other restaurants open. So they, they think of it as just kind of patterns and habits. Um, there are a few people who are part of the black veganism movement, you know, people like Dick Gregory, who are critical of fast food, um, members of the Nation of Islam, they target fast food, but they're, you know, this is processed food, and so therefore you should come to our restaurants. So people are uh, positioning it as, you know, you should go to an alternative, but the deep concern um, that we understand today, it's really late 80s, early 90s, where the Surgeon General is starting to think about the impact of fast food, and then that is dovetailed with um, some of the media analysis of the number of commercials that children are exposed to, and they find that programming that is designed for uh, black and Latino children, they have even more commercials. So it's a it's an important conversation that is a little bit newer than I think we think because it's such a commonplace understanding. Um, but I don't talk a lot about that because um, I want us to kind of think about how we got here to understand the challenges to those public health interventions. I think it's really hard to convince people not to eat McDonald's if they see McDonald's as something more than just a purveyor of food and a convener of community. I think it's a really hard message. And I think the more and more public health folks understand that McDonald's can mean so many different things in so many different communities, their interventions will be a little bit more sensitive to that. I will uh, say that it's mentioned in the program, the second McDonald's here in, McDon uh, in Minnesota, which was in St. Louis Park on West Lake Street, was open next to the high school. And one of the concerns by the community was kids were going to eat there instead of the more nutritious school lunches. So this was in the, uh, this was in the late 50s when that opened, 1958. So it was, it was on the minds, I don't think in the detail and the nuance, mm -hmm. but 
It was uh, and, definitely on the mind. And people also, I mean, the McDonald's brothers wanted McDonald's near high schools so they could get teenagers, but they were concerned also when McDonald's was expanding more about the teenage delinquency um, implications. This is where kids, you know, cut class and skip school and hang out. And so there's, you know, stories of truancy officers offering, you know, writing tickets to students because they're at McDonald's instead of class. Your comment really caught my attention about the, uh, the negatives of companies like McDonald's, but any other company doing social service sort of investments and projects. And uh, on the th theory, I take it that we'd be better off if government or philanthropic organizations did these things. And is the reason the matter of control, or is it that it lets the government and philanthropies off the hook. I mean, it, it seems in many cases these are, are worth doing, and I assume you wouldn't want the companies to just shut it down, but what exactly is your concern? My concern is that, um, that companies have a set of responsibility to shareholders in the bottom line that any kind of social facing or public facing work they do is subject to the other, you know, subject to the market, right? So we had a slow year. Is this the year that we invest in Girl Scouts or is this the year that we have to save? I mean, you can't, this idea that um, it is a sustainable practice for any company um, to make these commitments over the course of, of time is just, it's, it's revenue is too, um, I mean, there's so much revenue f fluctuation. We could also say that, you know, there's ways that we can reform the tax code to also make sure that we have consistent revenues, but um, also companies are, are led by a finite number of people who are not elected. So I don't think that they should have any direct relationship to well-being. You know, there's, there's, if it has to exist, right, corporate philanthropy can do very specific things, but I'm always concerned when that becomes our standard understanding of how to get things done. Right, and this is and this is. I work at a university. I mean, we're essentially a hedge fund that gives out diplomas. I mean, we are a, an investment vehicle. It's really hard to explain to students the importance of public service and the public good when they don't see it around them. And I've worked at state schools and I've worked at private schools, and I don't see much of a difference. And so I think this is about a bigger conversation about a level of divestment, so much so that we don't think of the government as a reasonable pathway to problem solving. And there's a lot of reasons why. I'm not saying that they're doing such a great job that we should, but I think that this is, that's, I think this is the best place we have to do this. It's not because it's ideal, but I think it's the best, or it's our last chance. And so the concession to the, the corporate world in making these decisions is really, really dangerous because like all of us, you know, Corporations and their investments and their attention is also sometimes influenced by the loudest voice in the room or the latest whim and the trend. I mean, do you remember when um, when um, Pepsi was entering education? Do you remember when like Pepsi had schools? Kansas City was one place where they had Pepsi academies, and you know we think of this as like, oh, this is probably not the best idea, but. There was a reason why this investment was made by school districts because they didn't have money, right? There was no revenue coming in. And so I think that, listen, I I'm not gonna undo, uh, you know, the, the, the toothpaste has, has left the tube. <laughs> um, but I do think that, um, you know, when I talk to people about this book, I say, if, if anything, next time a candidate for office says they're a pro-business candidate, ask them what that means exactly. Pro-business in terms of forgivable loans, pro-business in terms of ensuring that the business community pays taxes and has good wages, or pro-business in the sense that it will all trickle down on us. And I think we've, we've seen the limitations of that. The other thing I will say about black-owned business particularly, I think one of the greatest myths that we still operate under, that people in this period were operating under, is the, the 
that the success of black business can do anything for communities. It's just not true. Um, black business ownership can be meaningful. It has great historical ties. But the idea that investing in black business can close the social gaps of racial inequality is a, is a falsehood that we need to stop right now. Um, because what happens from the perspective of black business, they feel an overwhelming um, level of pressure to do things that they are not able to do. The majority of black business in the United States are a one person, single operator situation. Very few people are able to employ more than five people. So this idea that you open a number of black um, owned businesses in major urban areas like St. Louis and Detroit and then you know all boats will lift, that is a falsehood that we have to stop because that's where we see so much investment in. Um, and the other thing, which is also the strange poignancy of this story, is that a lot of black franchise owners who were millionaires were feeling very much pinched and pressed in moments of economic uncertainty. These are people who are very successful until Hurricane Katrina, until depopulation in cities like Chicago and Detroit, until COVID. And if you read, uh, if you enjoy reading lawsuits as much as I do, if you read the filing, <laughs> Um, from these 50 black franchise owners, it is a really fascinating look about um, the appearance of success and the reality of operating a business that has very you know, thin margins like a food business. You know, my number one priority is not to create a social justice campaign for franchise owners, and I realize that as black owned businesses in a sense, the pressures that they are under to fill these gaps are enormous. And so, you know, McDonald's, I hope McDonald's continues to be charitable, that's fine. But for McDonald's to be the kind of business leader that it could be, um, you know, if, if they changed wage standards, if they changed their sick leave policy, this could revolutionize the way people do business. Um, but they don't have to because no one's requiring them to. Uh, so there are a number of other uh, fast food franchises that are usually associated with the black community. And I'm thinking of uh, Popeye's Chicken and Church's Fried Chicken and maybe the Waffle House. Have these organizations done things differently than, than McDonald's? Or do they try to follow the McDonald's playbook? So everyone follows McDonald's playbook because it's, it's, it was the industry leader for a really long time. I don't think it is anymore, but um, McDonald's, once they showed success um, under their Black Stores initiative, as they called it in the 70s, Burger King followed suit, and then Kentucky Fried Chicken, and then some of these other brands that you talk about. Um, depending on what the business is, it has its own kind of different set of challenges and specificity. Um, from a global perspective, chicken is the future. Um, I was talking to someone that said, you know, because there are fewer prohibitions on the consumption of chicken versus beef, um, the global market for fried chicken has exploded. Uh, there's an excellent journalist named Andrew Park who's writing a global history of fried chicken. It's fascinating. He tells me about how it's a 10 year process to line up all of the purveyors for chickens to create KFC China. And he, there's a test case in Nigeria of the same thing, like what it takes to set up this kind of operation. So globally, I think fried chicken is kind of leading, um, leading the, the march of fast food. Um, but all of that is to say, yes, they follow the same playbook. Um, partnering with civil rights organizations to recruit. And also, in this early, in the early days, there was also um, alignment with particularly the Nixon White House in using the programs that Nixon had established with the Office of Minority Business Enterprise to teach these franchise owners how to apply for those grants. Because during this time, a McDonald's franchise was classified as a small business. So um, people are accessing loans to the minority business programs from small business and Office of Minority Business Enterprise. And this was actually one of the kind of signature positions of the Nixon White House was black capitalism. He gives a speech um, in Milwaukee shortly after King's assassination. He says, you know, I want to promote black power in the most productive sense of the word. Kind of weird for Nixon. But he understood that focusing on black capitalism 
allowed him to distance himself from the other demands of civil rights. So open housing, school integration, those issues kind of fall out of the conversation, but black business ownership becomes the central issue. Um, there's a story of a black owned fried chicken restaurant called All Pro Chicken that started by a guy named Brady Keyes who was on the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I talked to Brady's son and he said that um, Richard Nixon called his dad and said, open up one of your restaurants in Cleveland so I can show black voters what I've done. And he opened up a restaurant in Cleveland and Richard Nixon shows up and trying to siphon off that little bit of the black vote that was still voting Republican. So there was some real political um, weight behind these black owned businesses because they were a group of people who were willing to vote and support Nixon based solely on this business enterprise um, position. All right, I'm sure we could spend all day here asking questions, but I know, now it's about that hungry. time. Thank you.